Again, keep in mind, we're preaching a series on the uh, mountain-moving power of prayer. We've had quite a number of messages in this series already. If you were missing for any of them and would like to review them, you can find on our church's YouTube channel, our church's Facebook page. Both those are visible from the church website, which you can get to by scanning the QR code on your bulletin, and uh, that will take you to our calendar page. From there, you can see at the bottom of the page, there are links to our social media where you can view previous videos. We started the series with a message on uh, what prayer is, and then we talked about how not to pray before we started getting into the positive aspects of it. We looked at the six helper questions, which uh, who should pray? What should we pray as Jesus took his disciples through a pattern that he gave us in Matthew 6 that we call the Lord's Prayer, although it's really the disciples' prayer. And then in the previous two weeks, we looked at the where and when. Where should we pray? When should we pray? Is there a certain time of day or is there a certain number of times? Uh, and then what would be the best location for those? There are some thoughts in today's message that will be a review of those points. Uh, there's just simply no way to get around it as we talk about this morning, the message on Jesus, our example in prayer. And the last week we looked at the why and the how of prayer. Why should we pray? Because it is the height of arrogance to not pray. Uh, it's saying, God, I don't need you today. I can handle today's tasks myself. I can make today's decision myself without you. And we never are more like Satan than when we practice prayerlessness. And then we talked about some of the how to pray, not just the posture of prayer, but the practical aspects of prayer, keeping a prayer journal, keeping a log of answered prayers so that we can tell our children, so that we can look back ourselves when our faith is weak and see that God has met our needs in the past. And because God never changes, we can also expect him to meet our needs in the future and continue to answer the prayers that we pray according to his will. We move now to the topic of Jesus as our example. In coming weeks, we will look at uh, a snapshot of five people in the Bible who are noted for their prayers. And then we will look at five individuals post-Bible and their prayer lives and things that we'll see about, about them. But here's what we've got today. We're looking at Jesus, our example. Jesus should be our example in every area. Prayer would not be an exception in that, even though as you think about it, you might ask yourself, did Jesus really need to pray, being that he was very God himself? It wasn't as if he needed to pray to himself. You say, well, he was praying to the Father. Well, keep this in mind. Jesus is God, as I said. He's no less than God. God the Father, that is. He's no more than God. The Holy Spirit, even though we might have some sort of ranking in our head of where they might be, uh, there is there is none higher or lower. Uh, and as he offers prayers, when he enters into a attitude of prayer, he is offering prayers to an equal. Now you might say, I don't know if I like the thoughts of that, of, of God the Son being equal to God the Father. Well, we actually have scripture that even helps us see that as something that uh, indeed is the case. The Jews understood what it meant when you said the son of someone. The son of David was another, a name that Christ went by. The son of God, that has some very serious connotations there. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. When you see the name Ben in, in the Hebrew language, or you see Bar in Aramaic as you look at different names, uh, that means the son of. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the name Benjamin is saying he's the son of. Uh, he was originally named uh, Benami, and then he was known as Benjamin. Uh, when we talk about, when the Jews talk about someone in history, they might talk about um, Joseph ben Jacob. That's Joseph, the son of Jacob. That way you know which Joseph they're talking about. And in that, it's not just identifying who they are, but it's actually saying this man carries out, he demonstrates the same worth as his father's. He demonstrates attributes of his father, and he is of like 
kind and quality of his father. So when Jesus calls himself the son of God, or whenever others refer to him as the son of God, that is saying this man is God, not an inferior to him, but he is equal to God. And the Jews understood this, and that's why they wanted to kill him. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, but wait. See, I bought, you, might, you might think, uh, no, I, no, in my mind, I see God the Father here, and Jesus uh, just maybe you know a half step or so behind him, because d- didn't the Bible say somewhere that Jesus made himself lower than the angels? If he's lower than the angels, then he's definitely lower than God too, right? Doesn't it, doesn't it say that somewhere? It does actually say it in Philippians uh, chapter 2, where it says that he met, took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what we find in this passage there, this verse, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, he was in the form of God. If you look back in verse 5 of chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that being in the form of God, the morphe, the, the, the form of God. He was in the form of God. The same state that you can imagine God the Father is being in, Christ was in that same form, a spirit uh, with glory shining all around. Uh, but he chose, he made the decision to become a man, to take on the form of a servant. He was not any less God. He was in the form of God, in the form of the same as God the Father. He relinquished his brightness, his glory that man cannot look upon, so that he could dwell among us, as, as we find in, in John chapter 1. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, in verse 14. Uh, he relinquished that that spirit form, the eyes of flaming fire, the terrible form from which the heaven and earth will one day flee away, as we read in Revelation. Um, and he appeared just as one of us. But he was still every bit God, not any less God than he was whenever he was God in heaven. Uh, the Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, says it very well when it says, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity. Christ, still God, not any less God than he ever was. So you're saying, if he was God, and he was praying to God, why would God need to pray to God? And the verse that we have on the screen here about being in the form of a servant, in the form of a man, and humbling himself, is part of the first reason that we see him as our example in prayer. And we see, first of all, that he is our example in prayer, we see that in his submission. We see that in his submission there. In Luke 22, verse 39, we find the content of the prayer that Jesus offers here. Again, he's had the Last Supper with the disciples. They have sung a hymn. They departed and went into uh, the Mount of Olives. And they're sing, they're, they've sung a hymn, and then they're there at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is going to enter into a time of prayer here. Verse 39, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. Want there means accustomed to doing. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. So we see this is going to be a time of prayer. Prayer. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping like Felicity. Found them sleeping for sorrow. And he says, watch and pray that you're not in temptation. And then when the next verse we see Judas and the band of soldiers show up and Jesus, they're coming to arrest Jesus. We see here the content of the first time that he prayed. We don't see the content the second time we pray. We can fill in the gaps by looking at Matthew's gospel. Matthew has this to say. The first, the second, the first prayer we saw that he says, uh, he's asking if the cup can be removed. But either way, if not, 
Not my will, but yours be done. The second time he prayed, we find in the book of, of Matthew, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Both of those times, he, he has a steady expression of God's will be done first of all. Note that Jesus was submissive to the Father in all areas of his life, not just when it came to death. We think of some examples of times that he was submissive. In the very beginning of his ministry, prior to him calling his disciples, he spent 40 days, 40 nights, fasting and praying and enduring temptation in the wilderness. I don't mean to brag, but I went 40 without eating and drinking myself one time. Yes, it was 40 minutes, but I do want to say I'm quite proud of it. Uh, I, uh, when I came down with COVID, I may have actually gone 40 hours without eating. Or if I did, I could eat uh, the amount that I could hold in two hands here. Didn't want anything. Uh, but I can't say that I've gone 40 days. I don't think I could say I've gone two days. Could you imagine what it would take to be able to say no to food for 40 days? This was not something that his body wanted to do, but it was something that he needed to do to fulfill prophecy and to ready himself for his ministry. Uh, there may be reasons that we don't even know. But he submitted himself. He was willing to make a sacrifice for the sake of something bigger. And that describes Jesus' life over and over. Uh, we see that he went through Samaria for the purpose of reaching the woman at the well in John chapter 4. I'm going to tell you something that made a spell, something that you've heard your whole life. Because I've heard it too. And I've said it, in my, I've said it myself when I preached. Because one preacher somewhere says it, and like, oh, I like that, I'm going to say that. And you end up saying it, you just kind of repeat it. And it's like, maybe I should check that out. So, this past week, I checked it out. You've heard this before. I'm sure you have. Jews hated the Samaritans so much they wouldn't even pass through Samaria. They would go around it. They would cross the river and go around it and cross the river again to get to where they wanted to go in the northern area there at Galilee and so forth. You heard that before? I've heard it. I preach it. My study tells me that even in the time of Josephus, which lived in roughly the time of Christ, that it was common practice that Jews did pass through there. And you might say, well, but didn't the priest even, didn't the priest think they'd be defiled if they went through the city of the Samaritans? They actually recorded several priests who made the voyage through, and actually in some of the writings, some of the Mishnah, they say, you'll not be defiled if you pass through these areas. So you say, well, why do people say it? I don't know. They heard somebody say it somewhere, and they thought, well, that sounds good. I'm going to use it. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, but they wouldn't necessarily add days to their journey by making that roundabout way. So the most direct route to go from Jerusalem to Galilee was passing through Samaria. You say, well then, why was it that Jesus, why do you say Jesus submitted by going through Samaria? Understand this, if you did not take that roundabout way to go around Samaria to get to Galilee, if you were going through for the sake of being expedient and making the quickest journey from Jerusalem to Galilee, if you were time conscious and you were trying to make the quickest journey, then you wouldn't stop and spend what could have been hours talking to a Samaritan, and to be more specific, a Samaritan woman. Now, I'm not saying anything to denigrate you women that we have right here, but women in that culture were perceived as lower. They were perceived as less than men. So Jesus stopping to take time to minister to a seemingly insignificant woman would not have been, would not have had efficiency of travel on his mind. Jesus was willing to submit and take care of his father's business. He must needs go through Samaria. Look at another instance. He submitted and was in submission to his father by ministering to others when he himself was tired. Now I'm going to use a little bit of extrapolation here. 
The Bible doesn't say that Jesus was tired at this occasion, although it does tell us, tell us that he got tired and that he slept. He couldn't go without sleep. He had the limitations of a human body. But here's the account that I'm talking about when I say that Jesus ministered even when he was tired. In Matthew 14, we have the account of the feeding of the 5,000. And you have a conversation between Jesus and his disciples that says this. The disciples advocate sending the multitudes away for two reasons. They say, number one, this is a desert place. In other words, a deserted place. There's nothing out here. We can't even just go pick apples off trees. We can't pick corn cobs out of field. This is a deserted place. There's, there's nothing here. We can't eat off the land. You can't give them to eat off the land. And not only was it a deserted place, the second thing they say is this. The time is now past. In other words, it's late. We have had a full day of ministry today. It is late. And if I can extrapolate from that, what happens to you when it becomes late in the day? We are tired. The disciples were tired. They didn't want to fool with this. Jesus himself, having the same human limitations, had to been tired as well. But he was willing to submit to do what needed to be done. We know Jesus got tired because he slept on a boat in the Sea of Galilee during a storm. Uh, if you uh, start rocking me around and going back and forth and side to side, I'm going to wake up unless I am absolutely dog tired. Jesus got tired. But in this instance, he ministered to others even when he was tired. How else did he submit? Obviously, he endured hatred, name calling. He had his motives questioned. He had his ministry attacked. He had His teachings were misunderstood by those who did not have a believing heart. And all of this was done in the name of submission to his Father's will. Jesus wasn't trying to be unpopular when he made this, these statements. He wasn't trying to get followers and views on YouTube. He was not in it for the reaction. He did each of the things that he did to be submissive to his father. And then, of course, we think of ultimately prior to and on the cross, even as we're here in this passage, at the prayer that he offers there at the Mount of Olives, asking his father to please let the cup pass. The cup involves several things. Suffering on the cross. But even though there were a physical aspect, what Christ dreaded most of all was the fact of having the sin of all the world poured upon him as a sinless being, wearing the sins of mankind. And because of that, God having to turn away, being a purer eyes than to look upon evil, and the separation between God the Father and God the Son that had never happened in history before and would never happen again. He did not want that. If there's any other way, let it be. But if not, thy will be done. I said that Jesus is our example in his submission, in his attitude of not my will, but thine be done. Who was Jesus an example for? You're like, well, he had a group of men who followed him. He had large crowds, but he had a group of men that followed him everywhere. And out of the men that followed him everywhere, maybe all of them were like this one man. But there's one man in particular, out of the group of 12 that followed him, that had a real problem with submission. You might say, ah, I bet it was Judas because he turned his back on the Lord. You could say that. But there's one who we know more about who had a problem with submission. Do we know his name? Yeah, we know that there's at least one guy who had a lot of areas, a lot of problem with submission, and that was Simon Peter. If I asked you this morning, name something that Simon Peter did three times. Everyone in here would think of probably the same thing. And you'd say what? Okay, yeah, he did that. There's something very specifically he did during a short span of time as he warmed his hands at the fire. He denied the Lord three times, didn't he? To three different individuals, as best we can tell. Maybe the same, maybe the same mate. He denied the Lord three times. But do you know that there, in addition to 
Peter denied the Lord three times. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Things happen in groups of three with Peter. There are three times that Jesus, excuse me, there are three times that Simon Peter told Jesus, no. Have you ever told Jesus, no? Well, I'd say that maybe not with our mouths, but sometimes with our actions, we've probably told Jesus, no. Three times, Peter told Jesus, no. Think of these. Jesus revealed to his disciples that he was going to be arrested and tried and put to death on a Roman cross. What was Peter's reaction? Mm -mm. (laughs) You're wrong about that. Over my dead body. His exact words were, be it far from thee, Lord. This should not be unto thee. Jesus said, this is going to happen. And Peter said, no, it's not. Wow, what arrogance. What pride. What a lack of submission to say no to your Lord. A second time, Jesus says at that Lord's Supper that we were describing, just hours before he offers this prayer, in John 13, he girds a towel, takes off his outer garment, puts a towel on, taking on the form of a servant, just like what we read about Philippians 2, and promptly begins to wash the feet of his disciples. He comes to Peter. Peter says, what are you doing, Lord? He says, I've come to wash your feet. And Peter doesn't just say, no, no, thank you. He says, thou shalt never wash my feet. He says, no, no, you're not doing this. Maybe Peter realizes that it shouldn't have been Jesus all along who's doing this washing of feet. Maybe Peter realizes it should be me. Or it should be Bartholomew. I mean, what's Bartholomew good for except for washing feet? Or, you know, Philip. Get down in Thomas to wash these feet. Jesus, you shouldn't be doing this. But nonetheless, Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter says, oh, okay, change my mind, wash my feet. That's the second time that he tells the Lord, no. It's not directly stated here, but we could also insert again where Peter says, even though all these other disciples would deny you, I won't. And then he does. But there's a third instance in the book of Acts even. In Acts 10, Peter is sleeping in a house in Joppa. The Lord wakes him with a dream and a vision as he's lying there waiting for something to eat. And he wakes him with a dream where there's uh, a sheet let down from heaven with all kinds of what the Jews would consider unclean animals. What I would consider tasty eating. Pork, shrimp, lots of good stuff like that. But the Jews consider those things unclean. And the vision... The voice and the vision, which we know belongs to the Lord because of what Peter says in the second year, was from the Lord and it says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, Not so, Lord. No, I'm not going to do that. Peter had a problem with submission. He needed to understand from the Lord's example of submitting that he also needed to submit. If you sat in the first message of the series and saw the graphic, the mountain moving power of prayer, and you thought to yourself, oh goody, I've been looking for a way to get a greater percentage of my prayers answered. This is going to be a great series for me. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm so excited about this. Uh, This will be the ticket to getting what I want. Finally, I'll be able to live like those TV preachers say that I should. To name it and claim it. To have wealth and health and prosperity and, and, and all those good things. Well, you're going to be disappointed if that's what you think the series is about. This sentence is the heart of what Christ's model prayer is. Not my will, but thine be done. And until you get that attitude as you enter into prayer... You're really missing the whole point of prayer. Spending time in God's Word to find out what the heart of God is, and then communing with Him in prayer with the primary goal of seeing His will done will synchronize your will with His will. Thy will be done on earth 
where I live. If your will is done in earth as it is in heaven, it'll be done, your will will be done in my house. Your will will be done in my heart. Your will will be done in my life. And that's the main purpose of prayer. Read the Bible to know what God's will is, and then pray that God's will be done, meaning you are willing to change the things about you that are not aligning with God's will. Until you come to this point, you're going to hit a wall in your prayer life because everything will go fine until you don't get what you want. And then you'll pout and cry because God doesn't love you anymore because He didn't do exactly the thing that you wanted. And we have so many baby, immature Christians that give up on God when they pray for something and God doesn't answer the way that they want or doesn't answer the time they want. And they say, if God's not going to play the way that I wanted to play, I'm going to take my ball and go home. And there are immature believers all over the world, particularly in the United States, who are sitting home today because God didn't answer their prayer the way they wanted. And their feelings are hurt. The heroes you find in the Bible are not there because their wills were satisfied. They're listed in the Bible because they had a heart for satisfying God's will. You name any positive individual that you can find in Scripture, and what you'll find is that they had, at one point or another, the mindset of, God, your will be done. And that is my biggest challenge to you this morning. I could stop the message right now, and you're thinking, if you do, we can get to lunch a little early. But I could stop right now, and you would get the point of my message of understanding the importance of being able to say, your will be done in my life over my will. And when you reach that point, you're beginning to understand the example of Christ and His submission. But I do have two more points. So I'm not done quite yet. But these will go much quicker because my main emphasis is to get you to understand that in your prayers, you should be submissive as Christ was in His. Now secondly, the second thing that we see in His, in his prayer was... What happened? Nothing went anywhere. The second thing that we find about Jesus' prayer was we see Him in His solitude. Note that they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus brings all twelve disciples. He then brings three disciples a little further. And then He separates Himself, even from those disciples, to pray. We know He offered those two prayers from Matthew and Luke. And He offered a third prayer, a longer prayer, which spans all of John chapter 17. And he prayed these while he was alone. You say, well, then how did John write it down if John wasn't there with him? John received revelation from the Holy Spirit and learned after the fact what Jesus was praying with his Father. This wasn't the only time that Jesus prayed in solitude there in Luke 22. Here are some others. Matthew 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Luke 5, 16, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. I want to talk about that word withdrew for just a second there. I've inserted something that's not in Scripture, just as an understanding. Uh, that verb is in the present participle active, and it has the concept not just uh, he withdrew one time. I could say I jumped off of a 30-foot high dive, and I have once. And I learned, don't do it again. But I've done it one time. And when it says Jesus withdrew himself to pray, it doesn't just mean he, he one time went off by himself. And what it says there, that verb could be better understood as was withdrawing himself. In other words, he made a habit of doing that, of entering into solitary prayer. Mark 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart, that is by himself, to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there Alone. Luke 6, 12, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus makes it a habit to do this. Last week we examined the topic of public prayer versus private prayer, and we said that primarily your prayers need to be done in private, solo, 
in your chamber, in your closet, your bedroom, your, the place that is yours. Uh, Jesus did pray publicly a number of times. He prayed publicly in John 11 at Lazarus' resurrection. He prayed publicly uh, in another occasion too, uh, which I can't spot right now in my notes. You may have forgotten in Matthew 17, the reason for he and his disciples to go on to the Mount of Transfiguration was not just for the disciples to see him in his glory, but he went there, as it stated to them, for the purpose of prayer. He brought Peter, James, and John up there to pray. And if he's going to pray with them, it's going to be at least somewhat public in front of those uh, three men. Jesus gave his disciples a prayer to model. The subject of our what message on prayer? Parents, you will do well to pray in front of your children. Spouses, it's good to pray with each other. I'm not devaluing these when I talk about to model Jesus in His solitude. But what I'm trying to say is this. This verse here that we see on the screen says that Jesus prayed all night. There's no indication He took anyone with Him. And what I want to say with this is this. Prayer is a solitary work. And let me say this, just to reemphasize. It is work. Real prayer is work. And it's work that's done behind the scenes. There's no glory in it. It's work that you can't really put on a timesheet or brag about or fill out a report that you spent so much time in prayer. Most of the time, nobody's going to check up on you. And for that reason, it's tempting to let it slip because you say, no one will know. But understand, you can fool people some of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. And your spiritual growth will be stunted without the right amount of prayer. So as I talk about praying in solitude, in a sense, it is a lonely work. But understand that I might say that it's lonely because you're doing it alone with no other humans. But understand this, you're never alone. You're offering your prayers to God the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, is our advocate in heaven, who is also praying for us, and the Spirit within us, makes utterances and prays for us even when we cannot find the words. All three members of the Godhead are in tune when we are praying. And I can't think of any better company that I'd want to have. When you pray, you are in the very presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then we see Jesus in His submission. We see Jesus praying in His solitude. And then lastly, we see Him praying in His Supplication. Supplication is the verb. Uh, we, cut, we get the verb supply from that. We understand that Jesus is praying so that He will be supplied the power, the authority to carry out His miracles. We know that Jesus said, without me you can do nothing in John chapter 15. We understand that if we are going to do any type of spiritual work, that it's because God is working through us as a result of us asking for and receiving what He gives us. There is a theological debate on how Jesus was able to perform the miracles that He did throughout the Gospels. We have 37 different miracles recorded. John said at the end of his book, all the miracles that he did and all the works that he did and the messages that he preached, there's not enough room in the whole world. There's not enough pages. There's not enough ink to write it all down. So we have 37. Chances are he performed a hundred times that many miracles. And that might even be putting it, that might even be selling it short. I want you to think just a minute. I'm going to try to go through this little theological debate quickly because it's not the main point of what we have here, but it does lead us to an important thought. And here's the debate. Did Jesus set aside His divine power and depend solely on the Holy Spirit to perform miracles? Before you say, yeah, I like the sound of that. I think that sounds right. There are even verses that those can use who believe that to evidence that. Matthew 12, 18 it is a quotation of an Old Testament passage from Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I've chosen. Look down the middle of it. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Especially when we couple that with Acts 10.38 as Peter is preaching, again to Cornelius and his band, 
He says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power. Saying those two things together gives the connection with the anointing with the Holy Ghost equaled the anointing with power. Therefore, the power was in the Holy Ghost. So you say, okay, I believe that Jesus, and some people use the word, emptied himself, and therefore all the miracles that he did was completely relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. There are others that take the opposite view and say this. Jesus limited certain of his attributes, but with some exceptions. And so these exceptions of when he limited himself is when you saw miracles come forth. Not just miracles, but you see instances like the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus revealed his glory on the earth just that one time. He kept it concealed. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, as we referenced before. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Colton taught the other week to all of us in Sunday school and we acted out, you saw Jesus in His glory. But that didn't happen all the time. Most of the time, He kept it concealed. And then, think about this. Jesus can be all... uh, Let me say it this way. God can be all places at once, right? Jesus, being in the form of a physical body was limited to one place at a time. And Jesus could easily have have just, and I don't want to make a joke of this, I don't want to make it sound funny, but Jesus didn't float from place to place. He walked. His feet got dirty, just like ours do if we walk in on dirt roads. Uh, he didn't float. He didn't teleport from place to place. Now, he did pass through doors. Sometimes he passed through, he passed through crowds that were trying to kill him. So he did use it, some extra extraordinary power from time to time to get through things. There's one instance whenever he stilled the storm, and then the verse afterwards says, and immediately the disciples were at land. They could have been in the middle of the sea, and then once it says, peace be still, it says immediately they were at the land. He could have overridden the time-space continuum and put them at shore. But for the most part, he didn't do that. But we wonder, was Jesus doing these things through the power of the Holy Spirit? Or was he doing these things through his own power that he kept limited at certain times? Another time that he limited the power that was available to him was there as he was being tried by Pilate. He says, don't you know that I have the power? I can presently call 12 legions of angels and this won't even be a fight. I can stop this before it starts. But he didn't do that. He limited himself or emptied himself, as some say, And he had the power to do that. One day he will bring an army with him and destroy Israel's enemies. But he didn't do it then. So the question comes down to, did Jesus perform the miracles with his own power as the Son of God? Or did he perform the miracles through the Spirit's power? The Pharisees and scribes asked him a question one time. And they said, tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Before I get to that, we'll just take this example here. How did Jesus walk on the water? You're like, well, according to the laws of physics, I can't explain that. And and I can't either. But what enabled him to walk on the Sea of Galilee? Was it by being yielded to the Holy Spirit who led him to do this? Or was it because he was Jesus, he was the Son of God, and he could do it on his own? Whatever you say is that answer, understand this. However Jesus walked on the water, Peter walked on the water the same way. Oh, that's an interesting thought. So either Peter was able to walk on the water because Jesus as the Son of God gave him the power to walk on water because He commanded him to do it, and anything God commands you to do, He will also give you the power to do. Or if Jesus was walking on the water because the Holy Spirit was enabling him, then Peter himself was doing so under the power of the Spirit until he began to look around and became fearful and did no longer trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And that's when he began to sink. sink. So, which is the right answer? I said a second ago that the, that the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus, by what power do you do these things? And Jesus said, I got a question for you. The baptism of John, was it of men or was it of heaven? And they said, we, we can't give a good answer to that. That's a trap question. And so they said, we can't tell you the answer to that. And Jesus answered the question of whether or not Jesus was doing these things through his own power or through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this was his answer. I'm not telling you. So we don't have a definitive answer from Scripture. We can have our theories. I've got my theory. My theory actually says both of those are at play. 
Now, I want you to think about times that Christ prayed a supplicatory prayer. I'm going somewhere with that theological argument, so keep that in mind as we think through here. Here are times that Christ prayed. He prayed for Peter that his faith fail not. He says, Peter, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you that your faith fail not. He prayed a supplicatory prayer in Matthew 19, 13. People brought, Jesus, people brought their children to Jesus and wanted Him to pray over them. The disciples said, get, get these kids away from here. Again, if you, that society had a low value of women, that society had a low value of children. Guys, you'd be, you'd be left behind. You'd be, you'd be left out. They didn't want, you weren't supposed to be involved in the middle of something important where adults were talking. There's still a time and place for that, by the way. But these people are bringing their children to Jesus, and the disciples says, get these kids out of here. Jesus has more important things than your children. But Jesus didn't have more important things than the children. Jesus valued every soul. And he prayed for them. Understand this. Jesus even prayed a supplicatory prayer for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You prayed for your enemies lately? That's a tough one. I got to tell you, on my prayer app, I don't have a day set aside where I pray for my enemies. We're told to. In John 17, Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his current disciples. And Jesus prays for every person in this building. Say, did Jesus really pray for me in John 17? He sure did. Verse 20 says this, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which will believe on me through their word. Do you realize that you, sitting here in this church, are saved because the disciples preached to somebody? And the people that believed, they preached to somebody. And those people that believed, they preached to somebody, which preached to somebody, to somebody, to somebody. And because of the work the disciples did, you're sitting here today as a saved individual. Why? Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed for those that would be saved in the future. Now, I want to wrap this up this way. <coughs> I say to you, that Jesus performed His miracles in part because He was the Son of God and He was acting with His own power, and in part because He was reliant on the Spirit as He was submissive to the Father. And here's the reason that I say Jesus did that. Because we are sitting here now without Jesus present on the earth here beside me in a physical body. You say, Jesus is everywhere. Yes, that's true. The Spirit indwells me. John 14 makes this statement. And this one's a hard one to understand. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Question. Have any of you ever done a work that is greater than something that Jesus did? You're like... I can't even begin to picture what I could do that would be greater than anything that Jesus did. You don't have power that exceeds the power of Jesus Christ. We would all easily agree to that, right? So what in the world could he be talking about? Understand the pronouns that you see here. The works that I do shall he do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go into my Father I believe that the best interpretation of this verse is that we are talking about a collective assembly of the saved. And because of this, we as the current day church can do greater things than Jesus did. And by that, I view it this way, greater in number. Jesus lived 33 years with a ministry of three years and performed 37 recorded miracles, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of miracles, but he did all that in three years. How many years will we have to minister for Christ 
And how many things can we do in all those years and us being a congregation of a dozen compared to one man, Jesus? If we are in submission to Him, and if we are submitted to the Holy Spirit, and we are operating on His power, and each one of us could do something at least equal to what Christ did, then there's more than one of us here. And if we take the church at large, where there are millions, can millions do more than one? Yeah, should be able to. That's how I interpret this verse. That what that means is that we collectively can do a greater number of works than Christ did in His three-year ministry. But it's going to happen if we're willing to say, not my will, but thine be done. If we're to do greater works than Jesus did, it will be through following His model of supplicatory prayer, of asking and receiving so that we can do His work. I want to close this with a quote. I have it there on your bulletin for you to take home. It says this, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet, difference, distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Spoken by a Scottish minister, Robert Murray McShane. This particular man is fascinating in that he has books and writings and lots of quotations. You might expect him to have had a long life. He died at 30 years of age, but he died on fire from God. He died on fire for God. He died of typhoid fever. But he was sold out to God, and that's why we still know his name today. Because he believed in the power of prayer and modeling Christ's prayer as well. Take these three points, the way that Christ prayed for us, and apply them. Number one, are you submissive to the point that you are willing to put God's will in front of yours? Secondly, do you take time to get in solitary confinement to do the hard work of prayer? And then thirdly, are you asking for the things that you need that you might receive? Christ modeled all three of those. He's our model. Let our prayer be like Christ's prayer. Let us pray at this time as we wrap up. Heavenly Father, take this message. Lord, use it in our hearts. Lord, may we become like you in every area, but most importantly, in our prayer life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd like